Okay. Whew. Sorry I'm late, guys. Joe, what the f***? Uh, uh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I ran into a thing on the way. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, now that we're all here, hi! Uh, welcome to a very, very special uh, Bomb Squad Movie Night episode. Uh, I am your host and master of ceremony for this evening, Joseph Henry Vrenick, and today I have with me... Hi, I'm Austin Zwiebelman. I'm Tanner Richard Kraft. I'm Ten Men Soul. And today we have arguably our most special guest to date. Uh, my name is John McPhail and uh, I'm the director of Anna and the Apocalypse and we chat with you nice fellows about it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, we got the director of uh, today's uh, subject matter, Anna and the Apocalypse. One of my favorite movies of all time, one of my favorite Christmas movies of all time, and my favorite musical of all time. Hello? Can you hear me? But before we get into our thoughts on the movie, uh, we're, we're going to put our guest on his toes because he's got the first question <laughs> up here. This movie came out, uh, it debuted five years ago at Fantastic Fest and has since begun to uh, develop a very faithful cult following. I got to ask John, now that it's been five years, uh, how do you feel about the rise of this fan base that you've got going on here? What are your thoughts and feelings on the movie five years later? Oh, like, um, I'm just delighted to, like that, that people will people enjoy it. It. Like um, that was always the you know the objective. Just part of the reason I make movies is because I just want people to have a nice time and, and enjoy a, like a, an experience, um, and you know that people are like you know taking to their hearts and it's part of their like their, their Christmas traditions and stuff like that. It's like that's incredible. That's that's beyond what you know we, we sort of set out to do. So I'm um, delighted, delighted. It's a great film. I'm so happy that it's growing a fan base, and I'm happy you're happy with the uh, results, and I'm happy that I got to share this movie with more of my friends and we're gonna get into our thoughts here on you the movie. You think we're friends? Yeah, I have friends. <laughs> I say to the guy that lived on my couch for what, three months? <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> All right. Who are we gonna start with on this one? I think we are gonna go with Tim because I know you were out of like this group here. You were the first one of my friends to have seen this movie. Anybody who knows me knows that every October I do a 31 night horror movie marathon. I've been doing it since 2015. So in 2018, I thought it would be fun to do a 25 day marathon of Christmas movies in December. So, you know, I watched some of the like big ones like you got Gremlins, you got Black Christmas, you got Silent Night, Deadly Night. Garbage day! I discovered some really cool, like, lesser known ones, like Dial Code Santa Claus is really fun. I also watched some that aren't quite so hot, like Feeders 2 Sleigh Bells. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that month was when uh, the US release of Anime the Apocalypse came out, so I got to see that at St. Louis's Tivoli Theater and uh, had a really good time seeing it there. Generally, I'm not super big on musicals personally, like, there's some exceptions I, there's some musicals that I really love, like The Muppets Christmas Carol is one that I really love. Uh, Nightmare Before Christmas is one that I love. I think Christmas is really the secret seasoning to get me invested in a musical. So it works here. And I, I think that it, it really is effective. Like, I love that it's sort of this Shaun of the Dead as a Christmas musical type thing. I think it's a lot of fun. <laughs> there's a lot of fun character stuff. Like, there's some really great character arcs in there. That's sort of what's great about a lot of zombie media is like you have all of these character dynamics of everybody going through this apocalypse and I think that this really was like a unique approach to that and really enjoyed it. Hell yeah. What do I do? What do I do? Make the movie! Destroy the brain! All right, Tanner, you were texting oh, me man. all throughout your viewing because uh, <laughs> you, you watched the extended cut uh, last night. That's what was on Shutter. so. <laughs> mm -hmm. In my opinion, the superior version. Tell us, what are your thoughts on the movie? Ooh. Right. So, um, unlike uh, uh, Tim here, I personally am a, a huge fan of musicals. I f***ing love musicals. It's one of my favorite things. Uh, Spotify Wrapped was just a, like a couple days ago. One of my top genres was show tunes. So I, I very much <laughs> like musicals. Good morning, Usnavi. I love musicals. I love horror adjacent horror themed things. I love zombies. And I f***ing 
love Christmas, all right? These fuckers, they say Halloween's their favorite holiday. Fuck that, but I fucking love Christmas. I love the giving season. I love the little green circles they put on doors. What do they call those? Reefs. Christmas wreaths. Wreaths, thank you. I forgot <laughs> the word for wreaths. I was pretty much genetically predisposed to like this movie, and as Joe predicted, I loved Anna and the Apocalypse. It's a very fun movie. I love all the characters, Anna especially, obviously, but the music, the music is what really stood out to me. I don't know much about the songwriting process and how these songs came to be. Probably the director would know more about that than me, but um, I loved the music. I think it was the second number, which was called... Are you talking about Hollywood ending? Yeah, I think I texted you, is Hollywood ending the greatest song ever made? One thing scientists can agree on. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> I love all the characters and it um did make me emotional at several points because damn spoiler alert so many fucking people die in this movie holy <laughs> I, I text I texted Joe at some point. I'm like, who survives this? <laughs> shit? The best friend character dies. Most of the friend group dies. Grandma dies. That was sad. I fucking hated when Grandma died. And then the dad died. The dad was awesome, and it was really emotional and sad when he died. Mm. And Tanner Tanner's cries count. Tanner's Tanner's got got a <laughs> It made him cry live. <laughs> yeah. I didn't do anything. That was Tony. <laughs> oh, yeah. All Tony. Did this to myself, really. Um, for a movie where so many people die, it's uh, remarkably still a very fun movie. All the musical numbers are really fun and inventive. The choreography in this movie is genuinely incredible. It, it, it outranks a lot of choreography I've seen from Hollywood movies as of recently. You know, because it has choreography, unlike Dear Evan Hansen. Um... <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Joe, so much for introducing me to the movie. And John, thank you so much for making it. <laughs> no, thanks, Dave. No, thank you. Dude, trust me, I'm so happy to introduce people to this movie. It's one of my, it's one of my favorite things ever. All right. Austin, I know you've got some things to say about this. I know you're a fan, so let it on out, bud. I, I mean, it's a bang-up musical, about as good as anything Kenny Ortega's ever made. Thanks to really excellent song work from Tommy Riley and Roddy Hart, uh, it's no shock that they got drafted into a Spielberg project eventually. Those guys showed up with some serious jams. And, uh, Thank you. Sarah Swire did a really great job juggling an acting role with choreographing the dances. Uh, lots of fantastic wides. Thank you for the wides. Cannot explain how impressive turning my life around looks on a first time watch. The emotional core of the story actually plays really well, like what Tanner was saying. Uh, somebody said that they chose you, John McPhail, to direct because of the warmth that you brought to the movie, Where Do We Go From Here? And all I can say is, this movie made me cry because of a light up Christmas sweater. So that's well played. <laughs> oh, thanks, dude. This is also one of those movies that's like Evil Dead 2 in a lot of ways. Uh, it's gory, it's gotta be fun with a crowd full of fans. A good amount of it was filmed in a school. Um, but my favorite way that it's like Evil Dead 2 has got to be the way that the film becomes something even bigger once you start watching behind the scenes featurettes about it. Not only is the genesis of this project inspiring, watching it develop from an offbeat short that Ryan McHenry made in his third year at college into this magnificent, colorful feature film, but the way that everybody seems so fond about it in retrospective and the amount of heart that's in the finished film really feels special. It's like the antithesis of a production like Apocalypse Now. Uh, instead of a bunch of people getting sick and having a terrible time, the vibe you get learning about Anna is that people had a really wonderful time working and making this insane film. <laughs> you can go watch this on like Tubi, a bunch of places shutter right now if you really want to see it, but I'd actually recommend for this film, people go get the double disc extended Blu-ray edition instead. Seriously, you get footage of the crew turning the Edinburgh Film Festival into a real life zombie party. <laughs> Some of the original opening that's like La La Land meets Zombie Land, uh, and something's never changed. A really touching song that's got like seven cameo posters in the background, including one for a particularly important Takashi Miike film. <laughs> <laughs> Hop in into the Kakutori's man. Yeah. yeah. Also, it's just really funny how that head explosion panned out at the bowling alley. There's a ton of great stuff on the special features for this. I'd imagine that most people are going to like this movie if they give it a chance. It's the punk rock spawn of Disney Channel original movies and the 2000 odd zombie craze. But 
there's so much great stuff in the story of how this got made too. It warmed my heart and I really recommend jumping down that rabbit hole if you're into filmmaking. I hope that this gains bigger cult status over the years, like so many other movies that have that Orion logo out front at some point. Everyone did an excellent job. There's almost nothing out there like Anna in the Apocalypse. No, so, thanks, man. That's lovely. That's really lovely. Well, just... thank you. All right. My, my time to shine. John's heard a lot of this already because we, we followed each other on Twitter when he was on Twitter. I would not f***ing shut up about this movie when I saw it. How much do I love this movie? So here, here's the U.S. Uh, cut DVD. Uh, I, I showed the Blu-ray off. And <laughs> also, here's the f***ing soundtrack. Oh! Yeah, the soundtrack, I bought it on CD. I want to get it on vinyl at some point. At some point, I'm also getting the poster. I, I tried to get it before this podcast, but I didn't. I've got the Japanese release. Oh, what? Oh, nice. that is awesome. Oh, it's like one of the most exciting things about that, that being released, like in so many territories, was Japan and being able to get a Japanese poster and like a Japanese DVD. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I cannot overstate just how much I fucking love this movie. It's gonna be okay. Our parents will know what to do. At one point, uh, Tanner was talking about a uh, film essay that he wrote in film school about the Avengers, and he—it's oh like he why you got to embarrass me in front of the director? <laughs> I wrote my film essay on this fucking movie. Like that, that's how much I fucking love this movie. That's I, I wrote it. I wrote an entire essay on it. He, he, I got to talk about how much of a miracle this fucking movie is for me. I hate musicals. <laughs> I really <laughs> do not like musicals. There's, of course, exceptions of uh, like Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory is one of my favorite movies of all time. Recent examples, Tick, Tick, Boom. I, I enjoyed In the Heights, I guess. I really liked La La Land at the time, but I don't think I could ever watch that movie again because I lived that movie twice. <laughs> He's literally trapped in a musical for like two days, like like just trapped. Oh no! Um, I've been la 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 again. It's like if you were to ask me uh, in 2018 what my favorite musical was, um, I would have told you uh, Poultry Geist, Night of the Chicken Dead, was my favorite <laughs> musical of all time. The, the, it'll kind of lead into how I discovered this movie. I can't remember which movie it was that I saw, but I saw it. At local St. Louis Theater Ronnie's. I and mean, every movie that I saw up until December, the trailer for this movie would play. And I watched it. And it was like the cr critic quote, uh, Shaun of the Dead meets La La Land would come up. And I'm like, okay, you've already kind of sold me on this. And I love zombies. So that's another selling point. And it was What, what a Time to Be Alive was playing for the uh, US trailer. And I was like, okay, I think I kind of understand what this movie is. I expected this to be kind of a trauma movie. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> what I wound up getting was something so much f better than a trauma movie, and it's, ah, uh, man, I can't even put into words just how much I fucking love it. And it was a shame that the two times that I saw it in theaters, nobody was there. There was maybe like one other person. Boo! I was that other person. It, it, it's funny because it's like I caught it like the week that it came out and I kind of uh, was like, I really liked it. I tweeted out. It's like, I really like this movie. If uh, Ella Hunt, Sarah Swire, Ben Wiggins, all of the cast, if they don't become stars like within like the next five years, we committed like a humongous crime. That, that movie just could not leave my brain. And I saw it a second time, which is a very rare thing for me to do. I do not see movies in the theater twice. Come with us, Arthur. You can help. Don't patronize me, you f***ing janitor! Even better the second time around, I almost made it a third. But my ex fiance was like, nah, I don't want to see it. That, and that's why she's my ex fiance. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this movie quickly became one of my favorite movies of all time. So much so that it kind of influenced like short films I was making. Because I watched this in my third year of film school, which I guess is fitting considering Ryan McHenry made his uh, short film in his third year of film school. The, the poster for Double Bill intentionally apes the Anna and the Apocalypse poster. <laughs> Every actor in this deserves to be a star, and I'm actually like really f happy that Ella Hunt is the closest one to becoming a star. My God, she's she's perfect. She's like the perfect leading role. Like she carries the whole movie on her back and is an absolute delight to watch. Me, me, me. Call him me again. It's definitely working. 
and then you go like a couple years later, she's outshining Haley fucking Steinfeld. Like that, that's how good of a fucking actress she is. Though I will say, and I made her like an entire bullet point in my uh, film essay. I would say the one who outshines everyone in this entire fucking film is Sarah damn Swire. That's literally the bullet point that I had is Sarah damn Swire. That should be her new legal middle name. Justin Bieber's a zombie. Also, search hashtag evac selfie. Oh no. <laughs> we all deserve to go extinct. Everyone else is so f***ing good too. Marley Sue has like a really f***ing good musical number in this. It's no wonder she was nominated for uh, the Fangoria Chainsaw Award because like that whole scene is like one of the best scenes of the movie. But, she won a BAFTA uh, last year. <laughs> yeah, she won a BAFTA. Yeah, uh, she's, a, she's a f***ing BAFTA winner. Uh, she's nominated again this year, but uh, um, she didn't get it. But the the cast are incredible. Mar Marley is incredible as well. I've warmed your milk and made your favorite snack. So come on over and unload your sack. Even actors like who are like the veteran actors, like Mark Retton's really good. Like he brings a lot of warmth to it. Paul fucking K as the villain. <laughs> oh my God. He is clearly having the time of his life playing the villain, which would probably make Roger Ebert very happy because he wanted to see more of Paul K. Thumbs down for me too. I agree with everything you say, except I liked the goofy guy who gives him all the James Bond gadgets. Mentos? Yes. A minty based breath snack candy which doubles as a small explosive device. The musical numbers in this are f***ing incredible. Christmas means nothing without you. It is a song so loaded that you could probably <laughs> write an entire academic paper on it. Um, I, I remember watching the uh, behind the scenes stuff and you had said that South Park Bigger Longer Uncut was one of your favorite musicals, John. That That is probably the most South Park sounding song ever because it reminded me of uh, Christmas time once a year. <laughs> I love, love South Park, absolutely adore it. And uh, like, obviously when I was in high school, I was like, that's when it first like hit the internet. And South Park Bigger Longer Uncut, the tunes, the tunes and all, just, oh, they're amazing. I will say, Hollywood ending, great f song. I, I gotta say my favorite's turning my life around. Not just like musically, technically, like on a filmmaking level, that sequence is perfect. Like it's easily the best like musical number of the whole movie. Though I will say this, Human Voice, great musical number, really hits different when you watch it during a pandemic. Uh, <laughs> uh, like, <laughs> that's like, like, like it, it is a great number and I would argue that's the moments of the movie that it went from being a great movie to something special for me. It's an emotional number, like even before a pandemic, but when a pandemic hits, it hits differently. I need a I could go on all day about how much I love this movie. I've taken up a lot of time in that category, though. So we're going to go to general discussion. But first, uh, here is an ad break. Uh, here's Jason Alexander promoting KFC Popcorn Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Popcorn chicken to all and to all a good night. And we're back from ad break uh, for another ad. Uh, Tanner, you know all about this. Uh, you take away. Hi, Tanner Richard Craft here, Bomb Squad Productions. You may know me from such films as Bomb Squad Movie Night, Black Panther Wakanda Forever, and Bomb Squad Movie Night, Anna and the Apocalypse. The one you're watching right now. Do you like colors? Do you like movies? Do you like boards of wood with colors from movies in it? Then oh, I have a deal for you. MoviePalette.com, a beautiful fancy website that has these little works of art that take the primary color of every frame in the movie, slice it up into these little lines, and then make a whole little piece of art out of it. And one can be yours too. If you go down to the description of this video, you will see a link to the website moviepalette.com and also a promo code SQUAD15. That'll give you a 15% discount code on the movie palette of your choice. Again, that promo code is SQUAD15. You can maybe request they make one of Anna and the Apocalypse. I don't think they have one yet, but from what I understand, you can request any movie you want. Hell yeah. All right, now we're going to move on to general discussion slash trivia corner because I, I'm merging the two together because we got the director on here. I figured it would just be 100% absolutely useless to just have like 
a thing where I rattle off trivia. We, we can ask the guy anything and we could just talk about bits in the movie for the remainder of the podcast. So uh, if anyone has any questions or anything they want to bring up, we'll let you go first. All right, awesome. I got this. I got this. <laughs> what was the best day of crafty? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got one I desperately want to ask. What was it like going from making a film starring loads of old people to a film starring <laughs> loads of young people? Was it a big switch for you or did they feel complimentary in some way? It was strange because like the, the kids, like they kind of, we, we are in the apocalypse with the, with the cast, like we set up production base inside the school. So there was like certain floors that weren't being used um, and like we were using them in for, for, for production offices and, and, and stuff like that. Um, as well as like uh, costume, makeup and the, the dressing rooms. And they just felt like they were back at school again and all the teachers were away and they had the run of the school. So they would just be running about mental. Like they'd be running about having like Nerf gun fights and like the, the, the corridors. And like one day I was in my office and I could hear like like shouting and screaming and I came out and I was like, what's going on? And the, the girls are all standing outside their dressing room and they're like, they stole all our throws and you go in and the boys have got all sparkly throws and they've built a fort out of it. And they're like taking like a reception to come and spend a day in the, the, the fort. Like, yeah, it was ridiculous. They, they were just children, absolute children, but in the best way. And they were amazing because they just, like we all just love each other even like now you know we're all so still so close with that it made it everything just so easy because they just wanted to just do their best every single day every single time they come on the set they just wanted to hit their marks and support each other and, and support the movie like it was an absolute blessing and it was the same way like where do we go from here like like all the cast there were just like they just supported the movie and they wanted they were just loving being on set and, and playing in front of a camera like it's it's what they want to do you know and they were incredible like every day and when it came to like sort of bringing it down they knew when to sort of like you know just carry on right out of it because of the you know where the film goes to we were always had to sort of like um they would all go off into their own wee corners and you know and, and find their moment and, and come in and just and shine even like sort of like uh, Ben's like our next crew like they would all sit at different parts at lunch and all that and they would all like 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 pick on each other and like you know like as I said like they would just feel like carry on absolute carry on so so yeah, no, it was amazing. Righteous. That's the kind of attitude I kind of aspire to have on my sets, because God, that just sounds so much better than most of the sets I've ever been on. And this was a really fun shoot, and like, so I, I started there as a camera assistant, so like, you know, I worked in the camera department for years. So like a lot of people who were on this, like the A camera team were the camera team I used to work in. Do you know what I mean? So like, not only are they, you know, coming on as, you know, really, really good, good professionals, but also they're coming on to support me. Um, you know, like, I used to make a coffee, do you know what I mean? Now, now I'm their director. Like, most of the departments I'd worked with them. The designer, like, the, for, in the costume department, like, I, like me and her used to, like, do, do runs when we were trainees, you know? So it was such a warm set with, the, with, the, with both the cast and the crew. Because I have a curious question here. We all went to film school. We're all aspiring filmmakers here. And me specifically, uh, like I said, Said earlier i love musicals and as someone who would maybe like to one day direct a musical i'm just kind of curious what what's different about directing a musical versus a more traditional narrative piece like what what changes your your mindset if anything well i mean like like for everything every single musical piece or moment has to have a reason for being there it's not like it's been 12 minutes and we've not stopped and sang and dance let's let's <laughs> let's bar one right in there you know like you know everyone right. has to service the the characters of the story and you know alan mcdonald ryan mckenry and alan mcdonald alan just ended up taking on after ryan died and done a wonderful wonderful job of you know of, of, of sort of melding all the, those moments together you know every single time we were sort of like cause, you know there's a couple of numbers that get cut and we were always going like re, re, do we need it do we and it was that was always like the part of the process like is it doing its, its job um i never thought i wanted to direct a musical before ever <laughs> you know like it's just, it's just you know, like happiness of the cacatowries and things like that but like you know when i got this job i was like right oh, hey, i really need to go and do my homework and discover musicals um you know it was a fun fun journey you know and, and and i was like hold on a minute like i can actually stop and tell the entire audience everything this character's feeling right now this this, this is really sneaky this is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is cold like remember in blade runner when they put the voice over and everybody went mental like you know <laughs> I don't know why he saved my life. Maybe in those last moments he loved life more than he ever had before. I get to stop periodically through this movie and tell the audience this is how I'm feeling. <laughs> 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 oh, I got one. 
So this was an adaptation of um, Ryan McHenry's short film, uh, Zombie Musical. What was it like expanding that short film into a uh, bigger feature production? Well, I mean, like, the, the thing was, is like, I don't know if you know the, 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 the sort of like the, the history of it, but Ryan made the short, it, it won a new talent BAFTA award. Um, they obviously they were like going off to go and make the feature. And they were working on a film and, and met Roddy, and Roddy brought on Tommy, and then they found Alan, and Alan came on board to write with Ryan. Um, and unfortunately, Ryan got sick and um, passed away. And mm-hmm. Alan then um, sort of took it forward, and that's when they started to look for, for a new director. That's you know when I was approached about it. So it was a uh, like anything, like I can't put my head into what somebody else would have done or wanted to do. I could only do what what I wanted to do. And the producers, um, Nason and Nick, they like they believed in every part of that. Like the whole Harley, they got behind what I wanted to do, and yeah. Like they just sort of brought me into the fold, you know, it was like a sort of group that had all been together for a wee while. Like any good team, you know, you have to have that sort of belief and uh, as I said, they sort of believed in what I wanted to do and and nobody kind of like told me, no, it has to be like this because, you know, Ryan would have wanted it like that. It was that that never ever crossed Andy's lips. So I was just fully supported, which was which was brilliant because I feel like I'm I'm stepping into some big shoes because, you know, these guys were all making short films together. Well, I'm sure, like you guys have got like your mates, so, like you know, these are all so close mm-hmm. and tight, and that's what these guys all were. And sort of to accept me in and bring you know bring me out of the fold, and then sort of like put me up front and get behind me. It was you know it was really 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 special for that. So yeah, so it was big shoes to fill for the short, but like you know. I knew what I wanted to do with this. I wanted to make something so colourful and, 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 and bright and play with a whole bunch of genres. And, you know, it always kind of came to me the characters for me. The characters were just brilliant on the page. So they were really authentic to teenagers. Like, that's what I always feel like was great about this. It's like it's trying to be authentic to teenagers um, and sort of like that. <laughs> like, this, this the, like, every day is at end of the world for teenagers. Like, it's just like, you know, oh no, I need to go to school. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, oh, no. <laughs> and prom is tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> But imagine, like, you know, like teenagers at the end of the world, like, what would the problems be? You know, all, all that sort of side of it was just the things that, that sort of drew me in and that I wanted to sort of, like, sort of do justice. We could go through here quicker. Plus, it'll be fun, right, lads? Yeah, certain death is so much fun. How about that uh, mid credit I... scene, guys, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the the, the mid credit scene that's the ending for uh, both theatrical cuts. It reminded me a lot of that classic jump scare, uh, the old k energy drink video on the internet people used to prank each other with, where it's like a car going into the distance and then a zombie comes up out of nowhere. Uh, that, yes, it reminded me exactly of that. It got me. It was an effective jump scare. Jesus Christ. I think the jump scare would have gotten me, but unfortunately I had this weird thing where that banner that was flying across the screen, I kept going, is that banner CGI or real? I can't tell. Mm. <laughs> and then the thing popped that up and I'm like, CGI. Uh-huh. <laughs> there was an old lady that got up in one of the cinema screenings of it. I was standing in the back and this, this old lady had got up to leave at the end and she was walking out and, you know, like the banner was floating down and she turned around to watch it and then Santa Claus jumped out and she jumped out for <laughs> fucking skin and like, <laughs> everywhere. I was like, ah, ah. <laughs> One of the biggest laugh scenes that I have is uh, Chris's ingenious plan to make it to the school with uh, the uh, what Tanner called the most Pirates of the Caribbean sh- ever. <laughs> them walking around with the uh, yeah, I called it a Pirates them. of the Caribbean ass plan. <laughs> I was yeah. I was going to I was going to bring that up cuz like that's that's probably the one scene that's like probably the most just like uh anxiety driving cuz then, um, then they have the zombies right right over them and then one of them fucking <laughs> pisses on Sarah Slayer. <laughs> um, my question about that is how on earth did you get that shot um, of them in the pool? What's your secret? Sarah Dean was in the ball pit pool thing with them. So like literally like she was walking backwards and she had sort of like crew outside guiding her, guiding the whole thing. Um, but basically we were just like on, we were outside the school in the car park 
like <laughs> underneath that and like the monitors were off to one side and they were just sort of like walking backwards it's a, it, it was a sort of like a, like a, a wink and a nod to um, uh, Toy Story I think it's Toy Story 2 or Toy Story yes. 3 you know, like, <laughs> under, under the cones <laughs> yeah but when you actually look at it in the film it looks like wide and big it, so that thing had to have been like really friggin tight I could not imagine shooting that it's a wide lens we were like uh, we, we purposely played on wide lenses on certain uh, on certain times and, and I think nice. I that was one of them guys the head in the ball return when I saw the zombie head <laughs> come out of the ball return I lost my f-ing mind <laughs> that is one of the best uh, zombie kill moments like in just anything ever it's it's seriously friggin creative uh, it's fishing wire fishing wire <laughs> oh my goodness I was about to say ball returns are notoriously finicky sometimes you don't get your ball back I can't imagine sending a prop head through one <laughs> I think we only got three days in there as well. Like it was, it was quite a tight, tight shoot. But, but I think I got three full days in there to do everything. Um, and it was like one day. It was like the day we were doing like all the the fight sequence stuff. And I was like, I'm not a director today. I'm dictating. <laughs> like like ah. shut up, listen, right? You're going here, and this is happening here, and this happens here. <laughs> and, um, it was uh, it was just one of those days because it was just so jam packed and obviously trying to shoot is all that action. It was uh, it was uh, sort of like tight, but it was got it done. Um, it was great fun as, al- as always. There's like stuff from that sequence. I'm like I'm gutted because it's been cut. Um, uh, there was a bit with Chris because Chris is always sort of like going on about movies and like he hits the zombie and it goes and he's like, "Is it you okay?" And I'm like, oh, "Can you understand me?" And it grunts and he goes, "Okay." Who's your favourite Bond? Because mine's is Timothy. And he's about to say Timothy <laughs> Dalton. And it, it, it attacks him. And it was like, like I see it and I'm like, I wish I'd kept that joke head. Like, oh. <laughs> Speaking of Chris, I, I got to say, one of the most relatable things in this movie as a film school student, and I think uh, all of us can kind of agree, is uh, his introduction at the beginning when he's showing off his showreel and being told that, uh, yeah, I don't think this works. That is one of the most, re- <laughs> that is one of the most relatable things to like a specific breed of people that is film school students. It, it was good. It had like explosions copped in. He did great for a high school level. We, we shot all of that before we shot the film. It was like days away from shooting and then like I had the cast and we were just running about the school shooting like little bits and bobs. There was there was, there was other ones that were cut away there as well because there was one way um, Malcolm, who's, who's John, like in, in an air duct with the vest on, like, um, come out of the coast, we'll have a few laughs. <laughs> you know, there was like, like a whole bunch of stuff like that. And a little fun trivia is um, Christopher Laveau, who plays Chris, is the grandson of Robin Hardy, who who, uh, directed the Wicker Man. Um, oh! and that's why, like, there's a Wicker Man in the, the in the show reel. I would not have expected that. That's incredible. Y- you know what we surprisingly haven't talked about yet? At least I don't think anyone brought it up. How a delightfully fun a villain that principal character is. I love him. He's chewing up the scenery in every scene. It's he's having so much fun. <laughs> huh? I think it's about time we had a little chat about health and safety. I always wanted them by the end to be like my my Willy Wonka meets the Joker, like, and I was like, oh, he's like, oh, you got it. That 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 man in that movie predicted COVID nineteen. Sanitizer is your friend. (laughs) Yeah, when he said that at the beginning, I kind of like looked around, like, what the f did he know? He knew, and he let it happen. Two kids. They knew, and they let it happen. Two kids. Oh, oh, like with, with the kids, there was like um, the sort of like next crew before Soldier of War. There's um, all the shopping trolleys, and one of them is just full of toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that too, and I went, hmm, it's just, speaking "What do they so- know?" Speaking of Soldier at War, it's kind of my, one of my fun like in-universe theories. It's like that's the only time where it's like they're aware that they're like in a musical because <laughs> like because later in the in the movie, Ben Wiggins is like singing the song again when he's like going up against the zombies one on one. So I'm just kind of imagining imagining the soldier at war sequence just they're just watching this guy with his friends like killing zombies and singing the song that they probably came up with on the day because they're like looking at him like all crazy and they just start walking away from him once the song ends (laughs) i I love nick so much because he like follows the typical douchey boyfriend high school trope thing but like there's more depth to him than that he's a man of multitudes you know he did the douchey thing with the sex acting like he cared but also he like that shit when he was like, I killed my dad. I, when, when that line was dropped, I went, oh, f***. 
it's, it's, it's well, we're always wanting to try and sort of give them that sort of a little, little bit of redemption as well because it's like you know like when, when you were at high school bullies were they sucked but like bullies are bullied do you know what i mean like you know no, yeah you know bullies are bred like you know like so it always came from like you know he's, he's douchebag dad you know but you were talking about there was a there was a there was a meta joke that we cut out which was see when you go to the um uh rudolph's tree emporium and they were like you know should we go through here a little bit quicker uh, and they sort of vote on it like this sort of like vote on it uh, what initially happened was they were going to go through the, tr- the, the tree emporium they're like no that, that's ridiculous and as they're walking, like, I like to go, go start walking. There's another like group, and they're having a musical moment, and in, in the, uh, off in the distance, and they're watching it, going like, is, like is, "Is that what we look like?" You know, and then like a whole bunch of zombies attack them while they're in the middle of the musical moment, and they're like, "We go this way, we go this way." Uh, God, that's incredible. But we, we did, we did think it was a bit too meta as well. Whereas it, it's kind of cheeky with the um, at the end of Soldier of War, you know, it kind of just plays on it, you know, like the, the sort of like the tough guys. And nobody really gives a shit. <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved it, but I do like that the whole movie is like it's just very sincere. It like it enjoys being a musical. So, all right. We, let's wrap this up. Uh, we've had a fun time talking. We'll start with John. Um, do you have any final thoughts on your own movies or anything you want to say to uh, the fan base uh, that's been slowly accruing? Anything you want to say to us? One of you guys said earlier on, which was like, you, you know, you discovered this movie and, and that was always the plan for this, was that it would be a discovery movie. It would always be something that someone went and saw or, or, or by chance came across and goes, you have to watch this to their friends. And like, that's kind of like what's been incredible about this film is the people who it touches, they just love it and they just want to share it with everybody. Um, and it's what we need to grow and to find that audience. Like, you know, we are reliant on people doing that that's uh, and, and that was always the sort of like you know the, the genesis of the movie the, the, what it was going to be like the way that people's taken it and the way they have like just shout from the rooftops you have to see this you have you know and, and bring all their mates around and put it on or like force them to watch it you know <laughs> they are the ones who this movie's for this, this is who it is exactly for and you know we're just so lucky to have people who have just you know championed it and like you guys you know bringing us on to, you know bringing me on to chat about it and more people just hope Hopefully discover it and then they'll shout about it and you know it'll just continue like that hopefully hell yeah uh i i hope to introduce more people to this because god i i could talk about this movie all day but we're gonna get the guys' final thoughts tanner go uh, it's a wonderfully uh, beautiful movie that's Christmassy, it's hoary, and it's musically. And Joe, you were talking about this earlier. It's the sincereness that makes this movie magical. It would be so easy to make this concept and make it like some post-ironic bullshit, but it's not. It's very sincere in its what it is, and I think that's what makes it special and magical. It'd be so easy to make this the joke. It's a lot harder to make it sincere in what it is. Yeah, yeah. Austin, final thoughts. Uh, in the hilariously rare subgenre of musical horror, and in the apocalypse, stands out as one of the greats. It's a lot of fun. Go buy the fancy Blu-ray. You owe it to yourself. I can finally say something other than Repo, which is a recommendation I can never really stand. <laughs> stand by that sincerely. <laughs> Great vision, bad film. <laughs> uh, Tim, final thoughts. Thank you, Joe, for providing me with this rare opportunity to say this directly to the director of the film we're talking about. Movie good. (laughs) All right, my final thoughts. I love this movie. It's fun. It's funny. It's 100% sincere. John, you directed the fucking hell out of this movie. If I could compare you to any director that this kind of reminded me of, I got to say, Another one of my favorites, St. Louis's own James Gunn. Man, you just bring so much f***ing heart to this. Uh, oh, and, and, and I gotta say, and this goes for everyone involved in the cast, uh, if Ryan McHenry is out there somewhere in the universe, I genuinely hope he is proud of this, because you guys made something special. Real quick, you are sharing this with the cast, right? <laughs> Yo, yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah. shot in the dark. All right, shot in the dark. Hi, Ella Hunt. Uh, I would love to negotiate how much of my paycheck for the year uh, it would take for you to come onto the podcast and talk about robot overlords. And I promise that I will keep my questions about Jillian Anderson to a minimum. What have you done? 
Joe, I love you. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's our final thoughts on Anna and the Apocalypse. Uh, John, before before we go, uh, do you have anything that you want to promote? Do you have any upcoming projects that you want to plug? Dear David. There's, 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 I've got a few that's coming out. Uh, I've done a really good time with the, the, the cast and the, 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 the crew. Um, hopefully see that film soon. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, but I'm, I'm pitching as always. Um, I got a couple of films out for, for cast, but yeah, no, 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 you know, just just plugging away, just trying to make a life being a filmmaker. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's the dream. That's the dream. Uh-huh. Yeah, whenever those come out, everyone go check it out. Also, check out uh, Where Do We Go From Here, which is also available. It's on uh, Freebie. That it's a really f-ing good movie as well. Now let's wrap this thing up. All right, thank you all so so much for watching this very very f-ing special episode of Bomb Squad Movie Night. Let us all know what you thought down in the comments section below. Are you a fan of musicals? Have you even heard of this movie? Uh, if you have seen this movie, what's your favorite musical number? Uh, comment below. Let us know. While you're down there, hit the like button so we know how much you like us. Hit that subscribe button so we know how much you love us. Hit the bell icon to get up updates on uh, when we upload new videos. Check out our audio versions on Spotify. Check out our Patreon. The next patron legally gets to be my parent for a month. <laughs> <laughs> Check out our Twitch. Uh, we're going to be doing more live streams coming up, hopefully. Uh, I'm going to let Tanner introduce uh, next week's movie. Next week, we are going to be doing uh, one I'm very excited about. It is uh, probably my favorite Steven Spielberg movie. We're going to be doing Catch Me If You Can. Tom Hanks. Thanks, Leonardo DiCaprio, Christopher Walken. It'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> you don't want to miss it. Another unconventional Christmas movie. You're right. It does. It is pretty Christmassy. Yeah. Yeah. Stay tuned for that next week. Thank you all so much for watching. Thanks again, John, for coming on. Uh, and always remember this holiday season. Forget your troubles. Forget your woe. Live for today because you might be dead come tomorrow. We'll see you next <laughs> week, guys. Robert Downey Jr. has like a bazillion dollars. I slid my ticket across the table and I said, sorry guys, I gotta see about a girl.